Thank you for joining us once again for our Bible study on Sunday evening. We're going to be in John chapter 2. We're going to do 13 through 25, which is the final part of chapter 2. So next week we'll be getting into chapter 3. Chapter 3 is, is, is loaded with stuff. We'll be in it for a little while, but um, chapter 3 is fantastic. But chapter 2 here, we're going to finish up the, the final part of this. It's where the Passover is coming up and, and Jesus has, has went to the temple and he walks in and he is... Um, he becomes filled with this righteous anger for what they're doing in the temple. Uh, this is interesting because John here is using a, a physical description of the temple to declare a spiritual truth. This temple that Jesus enters, just so you know a little bit about it, is, is actually the second version of this temple. It was rebuilt after the Jews were released from Babylon. It was then later expanded on uh, by Herod the Great. Uh, some of the Jews now had turned this place into, uh, well, into a marketplace, for lack of a better word. They were exchanging common currencies for temple money. Um, if you know about temple money, it had no images on it, so there was no, so they would they would turn their money in that had graven images on it, and they could exchange it for money that did not have graven images on it. Sacrificial animals were being sold. All of this was about convenience. And for one thing, this was against God's law as stated in Deuteronomy. But that aside, it just it turned this place of worship and this house of prayer into a circus, into something that was just a spiritual travesty for God's chosen people. And, and Jesus, it, it angered him greatly when he walked in and he saw this with his eyes. Now this, this place where Jesus walks into... This part of the temple was kind of set aside for the Gentiles to come in to see God and to pray. Now, they weren't allowed anywhere else in the temple, but they would come in this particular place. And this, and this section of the temple was supposed to be reserved for that, but it had turned into this mockery of, of the meaning of a house of prayer. And they were just filled in there. I could imagine if you were to walk in, I mean, like if you were walking into Rocky Branch here, could you imagine if we had like tables set up all around and animals for sale and we were selling hats and, and all this stuff and people were trying to pray and everybody was loud bargaining with each other, almost like going to a flea market. It, it was just something that was terrible. And you may think we don't do that here. We don't, churches don't do that. They don't have marketplaces. They don't have... No, maybe not to this particular example. But what this example does show us is that sometimes convenience actually robs us from true worship. And we, I'm just going to go ahead and get into it. Actually, let's pray first. Let's bow our heads and pray, and then we'll jump into verse 13. We'll do 13 and, and 16 together. But let's pray first. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for all your blessings. Thank you for the hope that you give to us. Thank you for the encouragement that you give to us within our hearts. And Lord, I pray deeply, Father, that we are moved by this, that we rethink the way that we, that we worship, Father, that we rethink at least the mindset that we have when we walk in to your place of worship, Father, and we do so deeply, that we love you with all of our heart, soul, and mind, that we give our all to you, that that we, this time that we have set aside for, uh, for worship together as the body of Christ, that we just give everything to you, Lord. And thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for the sacrificial love that you've shown. Thank you for the grace, the love, and the mercy. And thank you, Lord, for all things. In your blessed and holy name I pray. Amen. Okay, so in verse 13 here, let me get it pulled up on the screen so we can see it. Uh, verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up, to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. This, everything about this right here in this part of the temple, you could sum it up by saying worthless worship. It was a convenient type of worship. That's what they probably originally had on their minds. And there was the inner court. That was only for the Jewish worshipers. And then there was the area of the inner court for only female Jewish worshipers. 
And then there was this outer court, and that was for all non-Jewish people. The outer court contained the, the Jewish emporium, if you will, this marketplace, this almost like a, a bank for exchange of money and for the people selling the animals. All of this was done in the name of convenience. You didn't have to come to prepared. Now here's where it starts to get on our toes a little bit. You don't have to come to prepared. You walked into the temple. You didn't have to pick out the best of your animals. You didn't have to set aside your funds. You didn't have to prepare any of this. They went into the temple. Everything was right there. Everything was convenient. They didn't have to think about it. They didn't have to pray about it. They, they could have handed over their money. Okay, here's my dove or here's my animal that I want to sacrifice today. It was just convenient. And we live in a world full of convenience. I am surrounded by convenience up here right now. I've got this laptop right here that you can see. This is how I'm controlling the video right now. Here I'm starting everything. I've got this tablet right here which shows me the scripture on it so I can see. I've also got this one over here as a backup, this TV so I can see the scripture. I have the scripture here in front of me in my Bible, which I still use. I've got my, my sermon notes here on this iPad. It's, it's convenient for me. But even with this, I recognize how even these items can rob us of the mindset when we're coming into church. And you may think that is a strange thing for me to say. I'm a network administrator by trade. Just like Paul was a tent maker, I make networks. I make servers. I do that for a living. I enjoy it. I'm, I have a very technical-minded mindset. I enjoy that stuff. I get satisfaction out of it. I understand the convenience of it. But I can also understand how it can rob us of true worship. I know when I started preaching, yeah, I wrote everything handwritten. It took more time. It, there, there was more preparation in it. My hand would hurt by the time that I was finished. I would have all these little labels, and I would have to uh, turn to my Bible to find all these things. And you, and you had to be pretty good at it. Otherwise, people are going to be waiting on you while you're trying to find it. If you're, you, know, you might forget that Genesis is in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. See, preachers do weirder things. But all of these items of convenience just like we're finding out here in this passage, can, can rob us of at least that mindset of worship. I mean, now when we come to church, you know, we do offer, well, we don't come to church now, but uh, when we will come to church, you know, we've got coffee downstairs, we've got a little curing machine down there, a little place to sit if you want to drink some coffee. And, uh, we, we keep everything at a nice temperature in here most of the time, try to keep everybody happy as we can. That's impossible, but we try. Uh, we, we've got screens up here for us to see the Scripture together. It's a mindset of convenience. Most of the time people may say, you know, I don't have to bring my Bible to church because it's on the screen. And I want to encourage you not to completely rely on this stuff. Always keep the Word of God with you somewhere. You know, I know a lot of people carry it on their phones, and that's fine. I have it on my phone. I have actually the same software on my phone that I do on my computer. I get all my commentaries on here. I could be up in the mountain somewhere, and I would have everything on my phone that I would have on my computer. But there is something special about the Word of God in book form. I, I'm not trying to be like some old school fuddy dud here, but there is something special about having the Bible in your hands. And I encourage you to keep a copy with you, keep it in your car with you, keep it certainly at home within reach. I had, when I was in um, middle school and high school, I started in band in sixth grade. And I was in band sixth, seventh, and eighth. And, um, and then in the seventh grade, I got a, a, a new band director. The other one had retired. We got a new one. I loved him. He's like one of my favorite people in all the world. His name is John Gallagher. I still refer to him as Mr. Gallagher. He keeps telling me not to call him that. I call him John, but he is, um, he is a fantastic man. Uh, I want to brag on him for a minute. He was, he was one of the first ones that I told that I was being called into the ministry because I was, I was called when I was in high school, my, my late junior year, early senior year, sometime around that time. Of course, I spoke to my mom. I spoke to my pastor, who was Scott Campbell at the time, and, um, and I talked to John. I trusted him. I still trust him. He's had me. He actually pastors over at Harvest Field on the other side of the river over there. Uh, I've preached over there several times. We've sang over there. We've done different things over there. I've done some youth thing for him over there. He, he, he's just a wonderful person. And he gave me some advice at some point. I don't remember when. Uh, he would tell me this, and there was another guy that would um, train me, uh, instruct me, extra lessons on the trumpet. His name was Craig. Uh, but they would always tell us to leave your instrument out somewhere where you can see it. 
because you're, you're more likely to pick it up and practice if it's sitting out. So I would have one of those three-legged tripod stands for my trumpet, and my trumpet would, the bell would go right on top of it, and that's, I would see it. And I, I, I agree with that. I was more likely to pick it up and, and practice it and play it. It's the same thing with the Word of God. Keep it out somewhere. It's not going to do us any good if it's shoved in a drawer or if it's up on a dusty shelf, but I just want to encourage you with this. This is the Word of God. You want to hear from God, read His Word. You want to know what He knows, read His Word. You want to see what's on His heart, read His Word, because you'll find that when you're studying deeply in His Word, that it, it reveals things to you that you might have missed before. And you could read the same passage over and over again, and I still find myself doing that today after all of these years. And you would hear any person that spent a lifetime studying Scripture, that they always learn new things. So I am encourage you to, to, to not completely just rely on convenience items, but, but have a copy of the Word of God with you. Of course, if you don't have a copy, I will get you a copy of God's Word. Uh, so please let me know that. But see, these worshipers that came into the temple, back to this, sorry for that little soapbox moment, they came in to worship, not with anything on their mind. They weren't worried about how they're going to worship God. They just came in. And we fall guilty on that as well because this is a, complete, a convenient place. Like I said, we, we, we know Sunday's coming. We know that it's going to be here at a certain time, and we show up. And we walk in, everything is prepared for us. Worship is just laid out. It's organized. It flows. We, we try to do all that the best that we can. But how often do you stay? This, this is supposed to be the end of the week, if you want to think of it like that. We're supposed to worship every day. And then it kind of builds up and it kind of leads up to the point to where we all come together and we worship together. It's the, the, the climax of the moment. It's for us to come together and join together and worship as a body of Christ. And then we start over again on Monday and we build up that worship again. But these people weren't. Many of us, we don't. We don't think about church. We don't think so much about God throughout the week, maybe a few prayers here and there. And then we just show up to church because that's what we do, because that's what we've always done. But that's not what it's for. It's supposed to be the end of it, the building up of something that is special and us meeting together. And these people were certainly not doing this here in this part of uh, Jerusalem in the temple. This in every way is worship without reverence. I'll say that again. It's worship without reverence. That's it. They were just showing up. They weren't thinking about how big God is. They weren't thinking about how special God is, how awesome God is. They were just showing up because that's what the law said that they were to do. And they were there to get their animals and they were going to go through this mindless, heartless sacrifice. And that was it. They were going to be done with it. That's all. It was just another day for them. You see, in this outer court, there would have been, think about this, the if you've ever been to a flea market, it's loud, it's chaotic, you hear animals, everything is going there. A flea market is a really good example. Think about this, though. They were walking into the temple. Keep in mind, the, the Jewish people were coming in for a specific purpose. They, were, they weren't supposed to be there. These Jewish, or the Gentiles, excuse me, these Gentile people were coming into the temple. They had no law to be there. They were just coming there to pray and worship, and that was supposed to be their place. But instead... All they heard were arguments about prices, disputes about coins, noisy animals. It was the chatter of a marketplace in the house of God. There is no way that we could spin that to say that these people were able to effectively and deeply pray and worship God with all of this going on. It was a distraction for them. It was did not fit what Jesus had once said when He said they were honoring God with their lips but their hearts were far from Him. That's all this was. They were just honoring God with their lips. They were honoring God with what they thought was convenience, and that was it. But they were not honoring God within their hearts. In fact, they were far from it. You know, when we attend a service of worship, but keep our spirit uninvolved in that. In other words, think about this. Have you been guilty of this? Because I know that I have. We attend a, a worship service, and I've even preached like this, where my heart truly wasn't in it, where I was distant, where I was thinking about something else, I was worried about something else, or I've, I've sang in the choir. I've sang in the choir my whole entire life, as far as I know. Even as a kid, I was in the choir at Old Piney. 
I love the choir. I love the ministry of the choir. I love the worship that it inspires in the choir. I love the message that comes out of the choir. Even many times in my life, I've stood up there, I've opened one of the hymnals, I've sang the songs, mindlessly singing the songs, not thinking one bit about the words that I'm saying, not thinking one little bit about what God has done in my life or about the God that I serve or thinking about His salvation, not thinking about anything. How many times have we done that, been guilty of that very thing, coming into church and we sit down in our spot and we're where your stuffed animals are right now. We sit down in our spot and we stay there and we listen, sort of hear the sermon and we hear the words being read and we might even sing along with the songs, but our heart is not in it whatsoever. That act is really no different than what was going on in this chapter. It's an act that dishonors God. Just because we have shown up doesn't mean that we have shown up. Sacrifice without devotion Isaiah called such sacrifices meaningless offerings. David told God that you do not delight in sacrifice. No animal that they sacrifice can make a person righteous before God. In fact, God hated that many times. He got tired of their sacrifices because He knew that their heart was not in it whatsoever. He knew that they were just doing these meaningless exercises, just following these laws just because they were supposed to. And I I hate the thought of that, of God looking down deep in my heart, me standing here right now, me looking and reading the Word of God. I would hate the thought of that, and I have hated the thought of that, of God looking down in my heart thinking, this is meaningless. His heart is not in it. His life is not in it. His spirit is not in it. Do you think, and I know that He does, but have you ever thought about that? You coming here to church, singing in the choir, participating in ministries, but yet knowing that your heart is not in it, knowing that that God is looking at you and looking at me, knowing where our true heart lies, that frightens me, that worries me, that concerns me, that, that causes me to want to fall down on my face and seek forgiveness for the things that I've done. You know, we also have this activity without prayer. The the outer court was the only place that these Gentiles could go to worship. They wouldn't allow them anywhere else in the temple, but they come to this outer court. In Mark 1, 11, 17, Jesus called the Father's house a house of prayer for all the nations. This place of prayer, though, had become a confusing, a squabbling, a stinking mess of people and animals, and it had far lost that meaning of being a house of prayer for all nations. No one could pray in that. No one could. I don't want to see our churches turned into that. Not just Rocky Branch, but all churches all over the world. I don't want to see us turn His house of prayer into something else. Into something that is just so loud and so booming and so confusing that we really miss the mark on that and we're just showing up for something else. You know, if we just show up to church just for the music, our heart is not in it. God forbid if you just show up to this church because of the preacher. God help you. But if you just do that, your heart is not in it. If you just show up just to sit next to the same person that you sit next to your whole entire life, your heart is not in it. If I, as the pastor, if I just show up because I am supposed to, and if I just preach a message just because I am supposed to, my heart is not in it. I don't want that to be. I don't want that to be a thing. I don't want to pray just because I'm supposed to pray. I don't want to just call out to God or to read His words just because that's something that I am supposed to do. I want to do it because my heart is in it. I want to do it because I am desperate to know more about God, that I'm desperate to deepen my relationship with Him. I don't want us to forget that. Now in the next part of the passage here in John chapter 2, this verses 17 through 22, and it says, His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Obviously they were mad because he did what he did. Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Of course he was speaking about himself. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. 
So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. As the Jews here, as they had witnessed Jesus cleansing and clearing out this temple, they remembered these words and they questioned these words. It was written of Christ in Psalm 60, 69 verse 9 that He would be consumed by zeal for God's house. And this is one of the many, many, over 400 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled while He was here in this life. And the disciples remembered that. That's, that's one of those things that we might skip through, one of those signs, but they remembered that when Jesus was crucified and when He rose again on the third day, especially when He rose. They remembered these words and they believed even more. Now in John uh, chapter 2, it's through 23 through 25, finish out this chapter. This is not particularly long. but Now when He was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in His name, observing His signs which He was doing. This is... This really sets us up for what we're going to talk about in chapter 3. This is good stuff. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting, your translation may say committing, himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man." This was all during this first, this, the same week that Jesus had uh, purged the temple. Um, John had not here in this part. This is one of the times where he didn't account for any of the signs that he committed. We don't know what else he did. We just know that he, he, he cleaned out the temple and he had done other things on top of this. And he didn't tell us what those things were. And it says that a lot of people believed. This, is, th this gets real right here because this is not... A, a saving type of faith that these people are convinced by. They see Jesus doing these miracles and they no doubt think He is something special. They no doubt think that He is something wonderful, but that's it. You see, Jesus knew what was going on in their hearts. And so that's why we get in verse... Uh, let me go back to that. In verse 24, But Jesus on His part was not entrusting or committing Himself to them, for He knew all men. You see, salvation is very much of a multi-part thing. We have God calling to us. We see that in like John 6 and other places where um, we have to be drawn by Him. We know that. We call that conviction. We call that other words. Um, but there was that point to where, and I remember it very clearly, where we were convicted by God. We felt drawn by God. We wanted to be with Him. We wanted to be saved. And then we responded. The other part to that. Remember that formula, believe plus receive equals become. And so this part right here shows the people responding in some way, but it was not a real faith response. They were responding to the works of God. They were responding to the miracles of God. And they believed in Him. That's it. They didn't believe that He was God necessarily. They didn't believe that He was a Savior. They didn't believe that He was a Messiah. They just believed. But Jesus did not commit Himself to them. Their salvation did not occur. They believe something. But He knew what was in their hearts. He knew what they were believing in. He knew what they were thinking. He knew everything about them. Why was that included in here? Part of that is because it introduces us to what's going on in chapter 3. Although there wasn't chapters, this was written as a, as a letter, if you will, as an account, and it flows. This flows into what we see in what we call chapter 3. But it also talks about what is going on in worship. Again, this is something that is difficult. This is something that is hard. We are not supposed to be here just to be here. We're not supposed to worship here just because it starts at a certain time on Sundays or it starts at a certain time on Wednesdays. We're not supposed to just listen to the live stream because we feel that we must. God wants us to worship Him in spirit and truth, which means that He wants us to worship Him with our whole hearts. He wants us to worship Him with everything that we are, honest, pure, humble worship. Not coerced worship, not because we, our family expects us to be here, not because uh, another member expects us to be here, not because you expect yourself to be there. But God wants us to worship Him completely, freely, and openly, and we cannot fool Him. We can't. 
We can stand here and I can stand here and I can use a lot of bold words and a lot of big words and I can flash my arms around and I can do all kinds of stuff and might convince you that my heart is in it and it may be far from in it. But I cannot fool God. I cannot say to God that I'm here because I want to be here when He knows in my heart that I may not be. You cannot do the same thing. You cannot show up to church with a smile on your face. And we can fool everybody else. But in God knows the heart of man. He needs no one to counsel him on that. He needs no one to fill him in on that because he knows our hearts. It sounds difficult. It sounds harsh. But God wants us to worship Him freely and openly and with everything that we are. With nothing. No other thoughts, no other worries, no other concerns. But God wants us to come to Him as a child. This is those little children that came up to Jesus and they sat on His lap. No thought about nothing, no fear about nothing. They were just there to see, sit on Jesus' lap. It's the same thing with us. The next time that we meet together, I want to encourage you with this. The next time that we meet together, let us not be here because we're opening back up. Let us not come for any other reason other than to meet together to worship God freely and openly with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul. And I pray that we can do that. I pray that our, the, the culture of church all across the world changes to one that is truly there just for God. No other reason. And that we can sit through a service, that I can preach through a sermon with no other thoughts or concerns or worries on my mind, but just to love God completely with everything that I am. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to be praying about that for this church. And I want you to pray for me. Because I am not perfect. I am not some holy, righteous, and pious individual that is standing here in this pulpit. I have my own fears. I have my own concerns. I have my own moments to where I have pity parties. I have my own moments to where I doubt things. But God is patient and God is loving and God is forgiving and God fills us with hope. And I want to ask for your prayers for me as well as much as I am praying for you. And again, I love you, and I hope that you've been encouraged by something that's in here. I know this was a little more harder and right to the point because that's what chapter 2 does. Chapter 3 is just interesting. Chapter 3 is one of my favorite chapters. It's the, uh, the story of, of Nicodemus. Uh, there is so much going on there. It's such deep stuff, and I'm going to try to bring all that out as best as I can. Again, if you have any questions about this, uh, you know, email me. Uh, send me a text, give me a phone call, and we'll talk about it. Nobody had any questions from last week, but if we do have questions, I'll, of course, answer you directly. But I also, I'll bring that question out the next time that we meet together, and, uh, just in case somebody else had the same question and they didn't answer or didn't ask it. But, uh, again, you all have a blessed rest of the week. Uh, be encouraged. Be hopeful. Not because of anything the government's going to do or not because of anything this body is going to do, but all because of God. Be encouraged because of God, because the one that we serve is not slowed down. The one that we serve is not hindered by anything. We serve a sovereign creator who knows all things, who sees all things, who is all-powerful. And that's the one that gives us true and lasting hope and joy. So thank you again. I'm going to close this out in prayer, and I will uh, see you on our devotional on Wednesday. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. Lord, thank you for... Scripture like this, Father, that helps us to really evaluate how we do worship, that really evaluate, help us to evaluate why we're here. And God, I pray that we all question that. We ask, why are we here? Are we here for someone else or are we here for God to just worship you freely and openly? And thank you, Lord, for all things. And I, and I praise you, Lord, and I, and I pray that I've blessed you today and I pray that I've glorified you today, Lord, and I pray that for us as believers as whoever is watching, that that be our aim and our goal is to always glorify God in all things. In your precious and most holy name I pray. Amen.